Thank you. Let me share a few of the guidelines with you. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. To comment and have discussions, please use the chat icon. Kindly submit your questions via the Q&A icon. It is now time to invite our president and chairman of council to deliver his welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kayode Falowo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aki Oshutoki. Um, dear patrons and council members of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm quite delighted to welcome you all to the oil and gas downstream and midstream sectors way forward webinar, which has been organized by the oil and gas group of our dear chamber. The MBCC, as you all know, is the foremost bilateral chamber of commerce in Nigeria and was founded in 1977 to promote trade and investment between Nigeria and Britain. The chamber is affiliated with the British Chambers of Commerce, which provides us access to a network of 53 chambers of commerce across the United Kingdom and 49 other international affiliates. Membership of MBCC is currently about 350 top corporate organization from all sectors of the economy in Nigeria. And as I always say, um, it is for what somebody to tell us which market leader in whichever sector of the Nigerian economy is not one of our distinguished members, from manufacturing to banking, to insurance, oil and gas, trading, and all the sectors of the Nigerian economy. We are very well represented, and more importantly, we are represented by market leaders in those sectors. I will therefore seize the opportunity of today's event to invite those who are yet to join us to please take the opportunity uh, by visiting our website and filling out the necessary membership forms. Our secretary will thereafter follow up with you and ensure that you enjoy the benefits that is attributable to becoming a member of the uh, uh, foremost Chamber of Commerce in Nigeria. Before proceeding, let me share some of our thoughts as a chamber on the oil and gas industry with this group of esteemed participants. Of course, I am not going to attempt uh, to replace the contributions that would be made by eminent speakers who are indeed uh, formidable specialists and knowledgeable experts in the oil and gas sector. On the part of the chamber, we believe that the overwhelming sentiment around the oil and gas sector in Nigeria today is at best cautious optimism following the disruptions that have occurred as a result of the global COVID-19 pandemic. The variables of supply, demand and prices have been negative and projections by experts do not suggest a return to normalcy as we know it soon. Rather, popular opinion is that a new normal is upon us in the global oil and gas industry. We do hope that with the announcement from Pfizer in terms of the vaccine for COVID-19, that maybe the turnaround in the global economy will be faster than earlier projected. Nigeria, being an import-dependent import oil and gas economy, is more impacted economically. Recent federal government statements confirmed that our nation's 
2020 revenue projection has been lowered by as much as 40 to 50 percent. Notwithstanding this recent development, there are still opportunities in the sector, and therefore we have reasons to be cautiously optimistic. We must, however, note that Nigeria still requires a higher share of globally available investment funds to unlock its massive proven reserves, grow the petroleum industry's contributions to domestic GDP, and translate this to inclusive socioeconomic growth for the people. For instance, recent data from the National Bureau of Statistics show that oil provided over 75% of government revenue and over 90% of its export earnings via taxes and royalties. I am certain that in the last few months, there would have been a significant shift in these statistics, given the fact that the contribution of oil and gas to the economy would have diminished, resulting from the effects of COVID-19. Notwithstanding the statistics, our contribution in the sector to the GDP still overs around 10%. Thus, while oil and gas are a critical enabler of Nigeria's budget, the GDP data suggests that there's room for improvement for the sector in order to achieve sustainable economic development. Furthermore, there is a rising global demand for cleaner sources of energy, such as liquefied natural gas and renewables. Many nations are setting ambitious targets with climate change and green energy advocates influencing the narrative. For example, uh, the Nigerian government recently declared the year 2020 as year of gas. The UK government, under its latest plans, projects a ban on the sale of new petrol vehicles, new petrol diesel or hybrid cars in the UK from 2035 are the latest. Also, a new normal that COVID-19 has further amplified the imperative of digitalization. Africa's oil and gas sector has 30% of production from legacy fields and the sub-Saharan portfolio of digitally behind assets risk becoming obsolete if digitalization is not embraced as soon as possible. Trend analysis projects that by 2015, Nigeria will become the world's third largest country by population, thereby becoming one of the six nations projected to have a population of over 300 million. As we all know, Population is the seed for market growth. And therefore, our population will enable growth, uh, hopefully. COVID-19, with a wide disruption to transportation systems, has also led to opportunities in seeking and focusing on nearby markets. Nigeria can certainly make the most of the new normal and embark, and embark on the path of sustainable socioeconomic development. The scenario today calls for a clear strategic framework that will make Nigeria's oil and gas industry and the larger economy stand out by creating opportunities across all sectors and for all stakeholders. Popular opinion remains that investable cash, which is safe, high quality, bankable projects and accompanying opportunities and recent empirical findings indicate that where countries tend to have liberal policies following inward flows, FDIs have grown. In other words, if we have the right policies in place, we will be in a position to attract international and local investments into this sector. In order to do this, Nigeria needs to have a renewed focus on its ease of doing business program. Secondly, government policies, legislation, 
and regulations be to recognize the impact of global conditions and realities, e.g. the cyclical and competitive nature of this particular industry, and therefore support the industry during both down and up times. Collaboration with stakeholders is imperative. In general, government should aim to sort of grow the pie by recognizing that other benefits from investments into the sector, such as employment generation, local content addition, uh, growth in tax revenues, et cetera, et cetera, will ultimately be beneficial to our economy. What we are seeing here is that government should ensure that it takes the approach of an enabler. And even if it has to invest in that industry, um, the benefit will come over time and it will be in many, many multiples of whatever government investment has been in the present time. Nigeria is at the verge of unveiling the much awaited petroleum industry bill with the promise of accelerated growth or accelerated passage into law. The bill provides an opportunity for the federal government of Nigeria and other stakeholders to reinvigorate the oil and gas industry. In 2015, the downstream subsector accounted for just 0.3% of Nigeria's GDP, thereby providing opportunities for massive improvement, which will further connect the industry to the wider economy and result in greater contribution to the country's GDP. Imagine policies should aim to transit Nigeria from a massive importer of petroleum products to a net exporter of petroleum products and value added petrochemicals in order to diversify our export base and enhance import substitution, GDP growth and employment generation. Growing domestic gas utilization and its derivatives like CNG and LPG also offer another opportunity to increase our GDP as this is a cleaner enabler which can power homes and industries and indeed a lot of the small and medium scale industries in our nation. Deepening local content and localization strategies will offer opportunities to avert capital flight, boost local skills development and reduce risk in the industry. Finally, we wish to note that global developments have presented an opportunity to meet the aspirations of government in terms of revenue generation and economic development while providing investors with a fair risk-based return and a more business-friendly environment. On behalf of the Nigerian Blue Chamber of Commerce, I am delighted, therefore, to introduce the impressive list of speakers who will shed light on the foregoing and provide deeper insights into the future of the oil and gas industry. Mr. Tunji Uyibanji, who is the Chief Executive Officer of 11 PLC, will welcome you. Mr. Uyibanji is a consumer professional with broad and varied career spanning over 30 years in the oil and gas industry. He has demonstrated the ability to lead large multinational organizations with experience in critical management and leadership roles. He has consistently displayed the ability to interact at senior levels within the industry and indeed in government circles. Our second speaker is a seasoned expert who has over 25 years experience in the oil and gas industry. He was before now, the managing director and board chairman of SNEPCO. He's a member of the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, Koren, a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. He's renowned for his strong strategic and commercial mindset, which is underpinned by solid technical background 
and excellent leadership capabilities. I am indeed delighted to welcome Tony Atta, Managing Director, Nigerian Liquefied Natural Gas Limited. Our third speaker is Mr. Mahmoud Tuko, Group Managing Director, Arch Group Group. He is an investment and management executive with over 26 years experience in the energy, maritime and infrastructure sectors of the economy. Prior to founding Hatch Group Energy, Mahmoud Tuko was the managing director CEO of Eterna PLC, an indigenous downstream company listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. I can attest to the fact that Mahmoud was able during his tenure to improve the fortunes of Eterna PLC. The company pioneered the provision of leased gas compression solutions amongst all the notable achievements in the oil service sector. He's currently the vice chairman of the Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association and serves on several other boards, including Abomet Nigeria Limited, the subsidiary of Julius Baja, and Polysmart Nigeria, a leading recycling company. Our moderator at today's webinar is Ms. Ronke Oronodeko, Principal Consultant, DRNL Consult Limited, and a member of the Export Advisory Panel, Nigerian Natural Resource Charter. With over 30 rich industry, 30 years rich industry experience, she's considered one of the frontline experts in Nigeria on project initiation and development, oil and gas operations, trading and marketing and management. She's on the board of several private and publicly quoted upstream and downstream companies and a consultant to the international banks and clientele in the energy, power, uh, and oil and gas sectors. Our wealth of experience revolves around food and beverage manufacturing, agriculture, and agribusiness, and energy trading. Ms. Onedeko is also active in the areas of mentoring, youth empowerment, and women empowerment. We are indeed delighted to have you share your rich experience with us today. I'm quite certain that this experts will do justice to the subject matter of this webinar, and we shall leave this event better informed about the key imperatives in the midstream and downstream oil and gas sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and wish you a productive session. I now have the pleasure to invite today's moderator, Ms. Ronke Onodeko. The panelists, Mr. Tunji Ebanji, Mr. Tony Atta, and Mabu Tuko, to share their views. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaya I mean, I'm totally blown away. You've touched the political, economic, and social aspects of Nigeria and the um, space that we're in right now. And I'm sure we're going to have a very exciting afternoon today with every night, uh, speakers we have on the list. Um, just to um, set the tone for our afternoon session, uh, Mr. Falawa has already given us a brief of what's been going on. And I'll just take a little time to um, pull out some of the um, deep insights that he's already mentioned. First and foremost, I just want to remind us that in the last 12 months, we had, to, we had um, a shift in the world economy. It slowed down towards the end of 20, um, 2019. And then soon after came in the avalanche of the COVID epidemic, which became a pandemic. More than that for us in Nigeria, being an oil and gas country, we saw the um, conflict between Russia and Saudi Arabia that brought the oil price crashing down from the 70s down to the 20s. And um, that accelerated a lot of things in this very crazy times that we had. You know, we, it's what you call a VOCA environment, volatile, uncertain, challenging, complex, and very ambiguous um, situation that we find ourselves in. But um, the challenges that have come have also brought about opportunities and a shift in the way we think. And for Nigeria, I mean, especially, we've had a lot of changes, both um, in the local space, in the sector and internationally. First and foremost, our income and our revenue has been impacted tremendously. It has seen the government have to bring down the um, benchmark 
so we've also seen the re revenues deployed to the budget shrink tremendously. And then on the local sense, we've seen that um, there's an almost force for the government to regulate and liberalize the downstream sector, especially concerning petroleum products, PMS specifically. And um, that has been something that a lot of people in the industry have been pushing for for a very long time. And we didn't really see a light at the end of the tunnel, but you know, um, one of the positives of COVID, of the COVID era for the oil and gas industry is the fact that the prices have now become market driven somewhat. And you know, we're still seeing certain changes. The topic for this afternoon speaks to some of these things. You know, what is our way forward? Liberalization, deregulation, you know, putting um, gas on the forefront, on the front burner. Gas has been an agenda for the government for many years, but we haven't really seen it as a front burner item, as we've seen this year, 2020, is the gas year for Nigeria. And um, we're going to see a lot of changes as a result of the focus that government is having for gas in our economy. We have these fantastic speakers lined up from the downstream sector, from the midstream sector, and um, we're going to have 10 minutes apiece. We have some people who have presentations, one person has a talk, and then we'll go into a panel discussion to bring out more insights. And I'm very, very particular when I am moderating to make sure that Nigerians and people who are listening in this afternoon understand how they fit into the picture. This is not a sector discussion among sector people. So we're not just speaking to ourselves. We're speaking to ourselves as industry practitioners, and as stakeholders in an economy that's driven considerable, considerably by the oil industry. Because as he said, 70 something percent of the income that the government has access to is coming from this industry. So you know, we, we have seen a lot of transformative initiatives put in place and put on the line by the government, especially in gas, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of distribution and marketing and financing of the sector. And these are some of the things that we are going to delve into. Um, two things that I want us to look at is that we need to make sense of where the sector is now and how the sector is going to move forward. And more than anything else, moving forward, what are the things we need to see being done? How are we going to exploit the initiatives on, you know, that are already ongoing? What other things do we need to see in terms of regulation and policy changes? How do we start to build capacity to take advantage of the opportunities and the challenges that are in place? So making sense of our oil and gas in the Nigeria context is one thing, and then making good these opportunities that come forth. I'm not going to take too much of your time. I'm going to have our first speaker, Mr. Tunji Oyebanji, the Managing Director and CEO of 11 PLC, take the floor now. And he's going to have 10 minutes of his presentation. There's going to be plenty of time to ask questions. So please put your questions um, and your comments in the question and answer box. And once we get to that stage, we will have them answered by our very erudite um, panelists that are on ground for you today. Thank you very much. Mr. Tunji Oyebanji, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, permit me to dispense with uh, uh, any protocols. I will rest on the, uh, those that have already been established uh, by the uh, chairman of today. Um, also, as you all heard, the moderator has given me only 10 minutes, uh, so it will be a bit like catching the train. Uh, however, uh, I'm sure this material will be shared, and uh, during the question and answer session, I'll be able to elaborate on any areas that I have not touched sufficiently. So with that, uh, Lamide, can you please go to the first slide? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, just uh, like the moderator has said, um, there may be people here who are not actually involved in the industry uh, who, uh, so just to give an overall picture of how uh, the, the industry is defined as far as the downstream is concerned in Nigeria today, uh, we have the national oil company, the NNPC, uh, which is really like the big elephant in the room. Uh, we have the depot sales model, which really deals mostly with uh, um, what we call DAPMA, which is people who have uh, 
terminals and basically imports uh, fuel uh, and sell. Then we have the retail sales model where people own or lease filling stations, uh, uh, largely represented by a group called Petroan. Um, then you have the integrated model, which is uh, a bit of a hybrid between depot sales and retail sales, which is mostly uh, where you have the Moman uh, members. And then uh, other players, of course, are the refineries, uh, the national oil company refineries, the Dangote refineries of this world, and some of the modular refineries. Then we have traders who are basically uh, uh, people who buy and sell products uh, almost like every other commodity. So in that space, you have people like Trafigura, Vitol, and so on and so forth. Then you have shippers who basically are involved in you know, moving the product uh, from refineries to uh, depot locations and terminal locations, not only uh, across the uh, seaways of Nigeria, but even indeed across borders. Then you have the bulk transporters, basically the truck owners who move products between the terminals and retail outlets. So next slide. So where are we today as far as uh, the situation in Nigeria? Well, on the 4th of June, the petroleum Products Pricing Regulatory Agency issued uh, a notice saying that uh, market-based pricing regime would start for PMS. Uh, and various announcements were then that in September, PPRA finally announced that it would no longer be involved in fixing prices or uh, pump prices of petrol, uh, disclosing that the interplay of market forces and not PPRA would determine how much Nigerians pay for gasoline. So this is, has been really uh, the, the story of the activities and what has happened in 2020. So we've moved from full deregulation, full regulation or fixing of prices by government, especially for PMS, to what they now say is a market-based uh, operation. Now, what are some of the challenges that have happened or do uh, currently exist within the downstream? Um, there's uh, the private sector investment is really, uh, you can see it, but it's not really at the level that it should be. And the primary reason simply is because the returns, particularly for fuels, uh, has been very poor. And as a result, investment has been limited. Uh, you may see terminals, you may see retail outlets, but there's a much, there's much more investment required, particularly in areas of pipelines, in areas of uh, safety infrastructure, uh, in, in terms of refineries and so on and so forth. And obviously this has led to the poor state of the industry and its infrastructure. And then as far as policies are concerned, even the deregulation that we've talked about is not backed up by legislation. These are be more like pronouncement, and we are in the industry. I've always felt that if we do not have uh, these things properly legislated upon, then when pressures come, government may may revert or or, or turn back the hand of uh, the clock as far as these items are concerned. And then, to a certain extent, there's a trust deficit between the Nigerian public. Uh, and consumers with the with the industry. People always tend to have the impression that, as they say, marketers take advantage and they cheat the public. So these are some of the challenges that exist to, today. Now, in preparing for the future, talking about the way forward, we looked, we're going to look at six building blocks, fair and transparent market, consumer protection, sound legislation, self-regulation, uh, technology and renewable energy. I'm going to dwell quite a lot on the issue of self-regulation as we move forward. Next slide. Fair and transparent market. Uh, well, essentially what we're talking about there is that forces of demand and supply will determine the PMS pump prices, which is the guideline that we have today. Uh, marketers to be able to fix pump prices based on their cost structure and their efficiencies. But in all that, NMPC, which is the dominant player, must ensure under such a regime that its own prices are commercially based. Because when you have a huge player in the industry uh, whose considerations may not always be purely commercial, 
uh, there's a tendency that decisions can be made that could end up distorting the market and make it difficult for private players. Uh, because we, we are importing most of the fuel that we, we consume in Nigeria today, access to Forex has to be for everybody at the same rate. Uh, there shouldn't be any sacred cows or any privileged people. Everybody should be able to access uh, foreign exchange at the same rate so that we have a competitive playing field. And then uh, infrastructure, those that are available in terms of, for instance, government jetties, government pipelines, government terminals should be accessible to players within the industry. So that means that I could import my products, land it at Atlas Cove and pump it through the government uh, NMPC pipeline system uh, to other parts of the, the country. Um, also, another building block is the consumer protection one, which I, I talked about, uh, and that has to involve uh, legislation supported price monitoring, check price gouging to make sure that unfair pricing practices are, are eliminated, uh, to make sure that competition is fair, that people are not ganging up together to fix prices in particular areas, and that standards and sanctions are available so that when you pay for five Naira's worth of fuel, you're sure of what you're getting. You're sure about the quality of the product that you are buying and the pump. So these are some of those building blocks that we talked about. On sound legislation, uh, like I said, most of what we've had now are government uh, announcements, guidelines. But what we in the industry are advocating is that the PIB that is uh, on the table at the moment should make sure that some of these things are entrenched in the law so that there will be no question of us going back or slipping back into the area that we, we had, uh, the kind of situation that we had before. So current legislation that encourages price regulation, in, but not lim including but not limited to NMPC Amendment Act, NMPC Projects Act, all these various things have to uh, be modified or repealed to tackle the current exigencies and areas of uh, focus. Things like um, the PPRA, PEF, DPR, and all of these things have to be repurposed to reflect the kind of deregulation that we, we now have. There's no point having institutions in place like uh, PPRA that are supposed to be organs geared towards regulating prices when you want to have a deregulated uh, economy. So the PIB obviously is a very important piece of legislation. We as the industry are trying to make inputs into it and hopefully at the end of the day, we'll come up with a piece of legislation that will definitely help to grow the industry. Next slide, please. On the, the subject of self-regulation, like I said, I would emphasize this area quite a bit. Um, as you know, we have various associations, uh, you know, Manufacturers Association of uh, uh, Nigeria, Lagos Chamber of Commerce, Nigeria Britain Chamber of Commerce. All these organizations have rules for their members. They have standards they expect their members to play by. And the same thing with the industry. Uh, as you go to the next slide, please, you find, like I said, in the downstream, you have things like uh, um, Moman, you have Ipman, you have uh, you have um, Petra, you have Dapma, uh, and we say self-regulation. The issue of good stewardship of the industry is the best form of regulation. It fills the gap in addressing industries' non adherence to international standards. All this is saying that all these associations, their members who are the key players within the industry, have to set standards and agree on those standards. Uh, and that will determine how they manage themselves over and beyond even the legislation that comes through the likes of PIB. Uh, I will skip over the next two slides that have to deal with examples of such associations in South Africa and in East Africa. Uh, we can read up on that uh, later, but essentially these are the same kind of things like you have Moman and Dapma in Nigeria. Um, on the next slide, uh, we talk about self-regulation again as regards to standard setting. Uh, around the world, technical standards are usually developed by the industry in consultation. 
standards are produced by technical standard committees of the industry association, which are made up of representatives of the industry. These cover issues like health and safety, product quality, customer governance and investment, human resource development, and so on and so forth. So this would have to be a key area that we have to focus on going forward, driven largely by the activities of those associations. Uh, on efficiency and cost, this obviously becomes uh, very paramount because we are now going to be in uh, an environment of free pricing. So you will find much more collaboration, people coming together to achieve efficiencies to lower costs so that they can and have a margin uh, to operate at the end of the day. The intention of this uh, is to avoid duplication and unnecessary costs and to avoid redundant and underutilized uh, assets. So what are the action points for the downstream associations? Like we said, they all need to develop a charter setting out the do's and don'ts for operations of their association and their members with focus on safety, corporate governance, integrity and transparency, service delivery, and so on and, and so forth. Uh, we do that through uh, the implementation of those rules set by the charter. So there'll be periodic visits by members to other members' facilities to make sure that they're operating at appropriate standards. And how, what will happen with the regulator? Um, invariably, uh, PIB is um, now suggesting that there will be a regulator for just the midstream and downstream. We think this is a welcome development. That regulator needs to work very closely with industry players to coordinate, collaborate, and consult to make sure that the, the standards that come out for the industry in Nigeria are standards that have everybody's buy-in and we all work hard towards achieving. Uh, very quickly on after, uh, basically, uh, the map there just shows movement of products uh, across various lines. It shows operational refineries, closed refineries, crude oil pipelines. Uh, with ACFA coming on in, into play, basically we need to get the economics of refining and distribution right in order to for us to fully benefit from this new Pan-African uh, arrangement. If we don't get it right, then we will not be able to get the full advantages of this uh, very, very progressive uh, development across the African continent because the vision should be that Nigeria should become the refining hub for West Africa and parts of uh, Southern Africa. Um, and we need to be able to get all these things right to be able to play actively in those fields. Uh, talking about renewable energy, I, I just put a schematic here for those who are interested in investing, for instance, in uh, compressed natural gas stations. Uh, it just shows, it's a schematic showing how the product moves from uh, the, the fields, production fields through gas pipelines to a compression station, into storage trucks, uh, into pressure reduction facilities at customer uh, uh, facilities, and into auto CNG stations. This is going to be a very, very big area for, for the future. Many countries in the world have CNG uh, trucks, uh, accounting for a very big chunk of uh, uh, truck movement or vehicular movement in those countries. It is an area of opportunity that I think we need to, to look at and develop upon. Uh, finally, uh, federal government imperatives as we move forward. Well, we talked about regulation. Uh, we have to have clear policy directives if we really want to build the CNG uh, market. So activities, I mean, just beyond saying 2020 is the year of gas, we need to have effective policies and uh, happily the government has set up the national gas uh, development program and that is uh, actively supporting through finance through policy uh, initiatives to help drive this whole concept of gas and it's not only cng it's also lng it's also lpg uh, we have to to expand these areas because that is the wave of the future uh, I'm sorry I've had to rush through. Uh, the moderator gave me only 10 minutes, but I'll be available to answer questions. It's a very interesting subject. So thank you for listening. 
Thank you very much, sir. Um, you are spot on with your timing. I appreciate that. He's talked about a whole range of things. I'm not going to, I'll give a brief summary at the end of all the three speakers. So I'm going to very quickly invite uh, Mr. Tony Atta, the Managing Director and CEO of Nigeria LNG Limited to take the floor. He's going to have a discussion with us. So please stay tuned. Thank you. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I'll just see if I can power my video. Okay, um, that was uh, very excellently delivered uh, by both the chairman and of course, uh, Mr. Oye Banji. Um, I have the unenviable, unenviable uh, task of following two, two great acts. Um, in 10 minutes, I will just do the little I can to give you sort of a top overview of who we are and uh, where we fit into the, in the scheme of things. But I hope that during the Q&A, we will have more opportunities to be able to deep dive and detail out on more areas of interest. So thank you for having me. Uh, we are Nigeria LNG. We are an incorporated joint venture in very active partnership with the government through NMPC uh, with 49% equity holding in the company. And of course, uh, three IOCs, Shell, Total and E and I, uh, we have the uh, very robust and uh, ambidextrous vision to continue to remain a global player uh, while helping to build a better Nigeria. You know, two opposing, if you like, uh, ambition, but we have linked uh, to the uh, to, to deliver on this. Um, to date, uh, we are number six in terms of our plant capacity uh, at 22 million tons per annum taking Nigeria's gas all over the world on our 23 ships, including uh, FOB vessels that come to load in Nigeria. We continue on the left-hand side of our vision to be a global player, uh, put, put uh, NLNG and Nigeria on the map. But we have been a six train plant for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, we have the ambition to grow to move away from being number six, there was a time where we were uh, top three and uh, about 10% of uh, market share, but today at number six and well below 6% of market share, given the uh, uh, arrival of the United States on the back of the Shell Revolution, Australia, and of course, Qatar continues to lead the fray. Um, we want to grow by 35% uh, capacity on the back of our Trend 7 project, some of you may have heard uh, very uh, loud uh, messages on Trend 7 when we took the uh, final investment decision back end of last year. Um, but today we are largely a gas business uh, with three streams of product, LNG, uh, condensate and LPG, which we bring into country. Most of our LNG uh, goes for export, but we have just started conversations around bringing LNG into country but mainly as a bridging uh, opportunity until our pipeline networks are, are fully uh, developed. Uh, when Mr. Oyebanji uh, put his uh, African map on the, uh, on, on, on the chat, I was looking for the pipeline networks uh, around gas to see business opportunities there, but I think uh, it looks like one uh, for, for the future. Um, before Nigeria LNG, Nigeria was number two in the, uh, terrible league of gas flaring nations in the world behind Russia. Uh, but since we've come in, uh, we have made a complete turnaround and a major difference in that storyline by moving now to number seven, having created the avenue to monetize and uh, harness our major resource, which otherwise was flared because Nigeria was largely uh, focusing on, uh, on oil. Today, we have helped to reduce gas flaring by more than 65%, helping the environment, but also converting that to value and uh, bringing major earnings to, to the country. And I'll touch on the numbers uh, in a bit. Um, Nigeria is number nine in the world in terms of uh, proof gas reserves. We have about 200 TCF of gas, but we do have the potential to leapfrog to number four if we can only just uh, develop the 600 additional TCF that we know about, but under the SEC rules, you really have to prove that by actually developing uh, as per the guidelines. So huge opportunity 
uh, for Nigeria and for Nigeria LNG to the extent that we have today as a country built our economy around oil. Over the last 50 years, everything has been oil, 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 and at the point we even flared more than 1 billion standard cubic feet of gas on a daily basis, just focusing on oil. But I believe that with the challenge of what we refer to as peak oil, energy transition, and changing energy mix, we would have no choice as a country than to shift focus to gas. And that is where Nigeria LNG is in the front line uh, of helping to build a better Nigeria. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference internationally and uh, a couple of fellows who are now friends today approached me, you know, and said, where are you from? So I said, I'm from Nigeria, proudly so. And then he said, oh, that gas nation that has some oil. I think that was the first time that it actually did strike me that indeed Nigeria is a gas nation. We have by far more gas than we do oil, but it's not very obvious because the focus has, uh, has been on, on oil. And I think that's part of the narrative uh, we are trying to, to, to change here. Uh, it's great to hear that the uh, Honorable Minister has declared that uh, 2020 is the year of gas, but uh, we agree. But more than just agreeing, we believe that it will be more than 2020. We need a national focus on gas to the extent that we declare the decade of gas and do everything we need to do, including the legislative and uh, fiscal positioning to ensure that gas can lift off and uh, take Nigeria to that next level, which we all uh, strongly uh, desire. Uh, gas will remain very prominent in the energy mix and continue to sustain more than 25% of the mix. Well, the focus is that oil will take a backseat. If anything, as it affects power generation, it is forecast that oil will diminish by more than 50%. And for those of you who follow, you have seen very strong signals, as mentioned, that a couple of nations are even beginning to uh, pass uh, 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 legislation around their participation in the use of fossil fuel. Some have said by 2040, we don't want to see any diesel or petrol cars on our roads anymore. Uh, the World Bank has made a statement of not financing anything underpinned by uh, fossil fuel going forward. So that period has come where Nigeria needs to wake up to the reality of the energy transition. And that's part of why we are so, so focused on uh, encouraging the government to really declare the decade of gas beyond the year of gas. I mean, even if you stay with the year of gas, COVID alone, as a game changer has taken out more than 75 percent of the year so i can imagine whatever the plans were uh, may not have been achieved and as such that catalyst to move us forward would have to be redeclared and we on this platform propose that the honorable minister will declare the decade of gas and whatever it takes nigeria should uh, position from a nigerian lng point of view to date we have contributed uh, more than six billion dollars in taxes to nigeria and more than $15 billion in uh, dividends to, to the federal government as part of being a partner on uh, Nigeria LNG and same for our IOC uh, shareholders as well. So we are a force for good. We continue to create value for country. We are the biggest taxpayer by far. I hope the FRS, FRS uh, uh, chairman is listening and he knows. And uh, so we continue to support Nigeria, but for me personally, I think one of the biggest support we have been given to Nigeria is around the access to energy side. Again, bringing LPG into country is a big deal for me personally. Uh, we started to bring LPG into Nigeria in 2007 when the then uh, President Tolishabo Basanjo invited NLNG to bring some uh, LPG into Nigeria. At that time, the total capacity consumption for Nigeria was just 50 tons, 50,000 tons. But I'm glad and proud today to say that having enabled the market and catalyzed it, Nigeria is at 1 million tons capacity today. And this year alone, we are contributing what is more than 350,000 tons of that 1 million. But that's not good enough because we can see on a per capita basis, Nigeria is actually far, far behind countries like Ghana, uh, Senegal, and, uh, and Morocco across the West African bloc. Whereas we have by far more resource, being uh, uh, the, the, the highest uh, gas resource holder 
in, 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 uh, in Africa. So there is a lot more that we can do. The opportunity is vast and huge. And we can make a difference by bringing more uh, access, more energy into country and creating that access for people. And I believe one key game changer of bringing LPG is one around the data of understanding that globally, globally, more than a million people die just from smoke inhalation. And in Nigeria, it's about 100,000 people who die annually. I mean, we say a lot about COVID today. If you look at the data and benchmark against the fatality as a result of indoor, indoor smoke inhalation at more than 100,000, largely women and children just trying to put food on the table die on a yearly basis in this country. I don't think Nigeria LNG on the back of our vision of helping to build a better Nigeria, want to reset that narrative by ensuring that we grow LPG and continue to boost LPG, which is why we have gone back to our board to uh, get a new mandate to deliver what is 450,000 tons next year. That's 100,000 tons more than we have done this year. And I think for me, that is a very positive contribution in terms of uh, access to energy. And we can do much more. Overall, Nigeria has been riding on oil uh, for the past 50 years. We have ridden on oil, on the back of oil. But we believe, given the energy transition, changing energy mix, and the world looking for cleaner, there is no alternative uh, if oil is going to take a back bench. Don't forget, as we often say, there's still coal in Enugu. But there comes a time where we may struggle if, as you heard in the chairman's uh, remark, the contribution to GDP is very, very low, but that's oil. We believe that it's time for gas. It's time for Nigeria to fly on the wings of gas to that next level. There's no other way for Nigeria to get to that next level without taking gas as the catalyst. We believe it's time for gas. Gas is power, gas to power. Gas is agriculture, gas is fertilizer. Gas is petrochemicals, gas to transport. I'm sure you will hear a bit more about CNG. But most importantly, gas is employment because it will revolutionize the, the industry and bring about that industrialization that we have been looking for. I must uh, hold it here and hope that there will be more stimulating questions to respond to. But I must say on the back end, it is time for gas. It is time for Nigeria LNG. But most importantly, it's time for Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Very engaging, very, very wide um, breath to get people to understand where you're playing and what you're doing and what you plan to do in the future. Without much ado, I'm going to call on my third panelist, Mr. Mahmoud Tuko, to please take the floor. He has a presentation. Thank you so much. Mahmoud, you have, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, okay. Good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. I will stand on all existing protocols. We are a little bit behind schedule. Uh, being the third speaker, I have the ominous task of uh, following uh, wonderful presentations. I will be as fast as I can. Uh, we'll work through so that we can spend more time questions. Uh, next slide, please. Go ahead. So I'm going to, I'm going to first of all talk about government policies um, and link it to what Tunji has said in the areas of product supply, infrastructure, uh, tax and governance. Next slide. So some of the some of the themes are repetitive. So where that's the case, I will uh, skip over them. NMPC launched Project White in 2019, and this was basically to try and curb excessive uh, product import or supply to the country and to understand where products were being distributed to. Uh, there's always a gap. How much is Nigeria consuming? Is it 30 million liters? Is it 60 million liters? What has been supplied into the market? Uh, what is our daily requirement? But the reality is that when prices in Nigeria at about 160 naira per liter ish at the pump here and across the border it's over 350, clearly there's an arbitrage and a motivation 
uh, put it that way, for products to uh, find their way across the border. So the product white, the uh, Operation White has stemmed that uh, area. I think obviously the focus now has been okay to ensure that supply is uh, stable. Uh, DSDP has been a focus area for NPC. Uh, in Nigeria, we take for granted that we should have petrol, and rightly so. And we all know that all it takes is one or two days of disruption and everybody gets agitated. Just from the NSARS movement, because products could not be loaded out of Lagos, Port Harcourt, uh, Wari, and Calabar, within a number of days, queues started to uh, again surface in Abuja. So we're very sensitive to fuel supply and distribution in the country. And as we go along, because we're so dependent on it, there are no other um, key energy drivers that we have. The National Gas Expansion Program is very key. Tony has talked about the Ministry of Petroleum declaring 2020 as the year of gas, but obviously we need a decade of gas. In terms of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure is mainly owned by government. Uh, it's decaying. There's no free access to it. And at the same time, now NMPC has recently launched a tender to try and get private sector participation into rehabilitating some of these old uh, infrastructure to help the country move forward. Uh, there are very exciting projects like the AKK pipeline, which has been funded primarily by the China National Oil Corporation. NMPC is also raising money uh, in very innovative ways to try and finance their refineries. Uh, the NCDMB, as you know, there's a 1% fund, so they're, they're generating a lot of money. And we're happy to see that part of those, part of those funds now are going into, into key infrastructure projects, equity, uh, into refineries. So without the equity, it would have been very difficult uh, for debt to be raised. So for example, the Walter Smith refinery, uh, NCMB is a, is, a, is a shareholder there. And I think without that equity investment, it would have been very difficult uh, for the share, for the promoters to move that project forward. The African Free uh, Trade Continental Agreement is actually going to help with infrastructure to connect infrastructure across West Africa. Uh, the WAGP is something that's already working, uh, but we see a lot more opportunities as Tunji had shown in the previous map. Going to the big elephant in terms of tax and governance, the removal of subsidy. So we can imagine the trillions of Naira that has been spent on subsidy. If that had been spent on uh, infrastructure in the country, on gas in the country, on other areas, what it would have done for Nigeria. Indeed, there's no policy around that. Uh, it's just a pronouncement and I think you have to again thank NMBC and the government for taking that initiative. We missed the opportunity in 2015 when oil prices were low. We missed it in 2016. And I think by the time government really took a second look at how much had been spent on subsidy between 2015 and 2020, when oil prices crashed as a result of COVID, they had absolutely no option than to just immediately announce a drop in price. So yes, prices have begun to increase as the crude oil price has increased. The reality is that we cannot, on one hand, want high crude oil prices to be able to swell up our national coffers, and on the other hand, want to enjoy low oil prices in terms of uh, price of refined petroleum products. The two cannot uh, coexist. So it is better that we deregulate the market and really let the water find its level. I think consumption will drop, uh, infrastructure and investment will increase, and the country will be better for it. Uh, one of the key themes around governance talked about the minimum uh, tax. We understand that, yes, but you know, if you look at the tax indices for GDP, et cetera, Nigeria is still lagging behind, and the FIRS is working hard to increase the tax net. Uh, the minimum, the finance tax, uh, sorry, the finance act of 2020 goes a long way in addressing some of these uh, key gaps. But turnover on profits for uh, the oil and gas industry is a no-no. So I think there's a lot of advocacy in engaging government. That was an area that was missed. We simply cannot pay tax on, uh, on, on turnover rather than profits. That's something that the government needs to urgently look into. And at the same time, we do expect that uh, more desk audits and investigations by the FIRS into the oil sector. Uh, VAT on LPG, we talked about that. All misnomers. So if you were importing LPG, um, you know, there was no VAT, but if you were uh, selling LPG domestically, then there was VAT. So that's been dealt with. But it just showed the sort of uh, you know, infrastructure gaps and sort of the policy gaps that uh, slowed down development in the country. Next slide, please. 
talked about crude oil price, and that's affected our, our country, of course. Um, there's a decline in the reserves. The currency has depreciated. What is the real cost of FX? Is it 387? Is it 470? The reality is that this is not, this is not another downturn. Uh, we have a major problem. There's a, there are key, there's a key challenge in the, in the industry, and we need new ways of thinking, and that is now. So we have to abandon the way we've done business in the past and focus on what is the future and say, what happened in the past is the past. We can't, we can't uh, undo it, but we must draw the line. We can't continue to make uh, the same mistakes and expect different results. Uh, PIB obviously gives us massive potential to transform the industry. Uh, given the historical focus <clears throat> has been more on upstream, uh, the application of the regulatory authority, so you've got to have upstream regulatory authority and a midstream uh, and a downstream regulatory authority. That will really help uh, develop development of policies. It will help the development of the sector. <clears throat> and as the PIB is passed into law, uh, hopefully sometime next year, we'll see a major transformation of the gas value chain. Uh, refineries are being built right now. Some investment is coming into the country, but all of that is expecting that these laws will be passed in and then you know, to back up policies with actual law. Uh, in terms of national uh, gas consumption, again, we're seeing growth in uh, CNG, seeing growth in power generation systems. We've talked about gas for long, long term haulage, so I don't want to repeat uh, these areas. We can go to the next slide. In terms of re redefining the future, I'd like to take it from a global perspective. Next slide. We just see quickly uh, renewable energy is growing from 4% to 15%. It's estimated to grow by year 2040. So huge growth, uh, huge growth. But then oil and gas is still very relevant. Yes, oil uh, decreased from 34% to 27%, and gas will have improved from 24 to 26%. The mix is going to change. It's going to take time. This is a forecast. There may be other uh, accelerators that may change the dynamics. I'm sure another census will be done sort of 2030 or 2025 to look at, you know, uh, these are real forecasts all the time estimate, but it just shows the oil and gas, as much as we're moving away from oil and gas to uh, renewable energy, it's a long way away from that, uh, you know, the lofty target that we set for ourselves. Next slide, please. And taking it into Nigeria, Nigeria will still be an oil and gas zone. I mean, coal is there somewhere. We also have um, um, hydro growing on, on a daily basis. Mambilla should come on stream in the next few years. Uh, Shiroro and the other ones who have been uh, plants which have been privatized have shown that when they are in private sector hands, these you know, uh, hydro driven uh, plants can actually contribute significantly to our energy demands. Next slide, please. What is driving our energy drive? Uh, you know, what are the drivers for energy uh, consumption in Nigeria? Obviously, population growth. We are already at 200 million, uh, it's expected to reach 400 million. By 2050, that is a staggering number. I, 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 I get scared when I think of such a number and the import of not just energy, but infrastructure and everything else. Uh, we are a major market for everybody. I mean, MTN came here and became uh, number one you know, in Africa because of the business in Nigeria. Any company that comes in, looks at the mass market that is aimed at consumers and you know, will always do well in Nigeria because that population group, well, that population is already there. Uh, the MBS uh, statistics show that 50% of Nigerians live in urban areas. So this is obviously going to have a key driver for uh, industrial production and cooling and mobility. The government has very strong industrialization plans. Uh, again, there's a major emphasis on infrastructure development, rail, and so on, and housing and roads. So all this is going to have an impact in driving our energy demands going forward. Next slide. Natural gas, I don't want to uh, get too much. I think Tony has covered a lot of that. But the you know, NFPC says they estimate that the growth in gas will move from 1.5 billion standard cubic feet a day to 7.4 by 2020, 2027. So what this shows is that gas is very key. Um, and I'll, NLNG and you know, the impact of NLNG in, 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 in Nigeria, I just focus on saying that, look, in 2007, Tony mentioned we were 50,000 tons and now we're at a million tons for 2020. But look at the price. Price has dropped from $1,800 per ton to just 500. Whereas export price 
has also gone down. So it shows that, I mean, we were paying far too much. We are a gas nation producing oil. We were spending money subsidizing, you know, throwing money into PMS subsidy when actually the cleaner, cheaper alternative fuel was gas. So thankfully we've been able to drop the price of uh, LPG by over two thirds in Nigeria and it will continue to, to drop to almost at the point where it's, it's practically free. At least, you know, if we're going to subsidize anything, let's subsidize gas. Uh, it's, it's cheaper, it's healthier, and it's abundantly available. Next slide, please. So in basically in concluding, um, we're seeing the likes of BP uh, talk about net neutral by 2050. Uh, the energy transition movement was already on the way. We keep talking about it. It's been accelerated by COVID. Electric vehicles are coming. Uh, we need to look at our energy mix in, in order to be able to meet the various requirements of uh, different sectors. Uh, we're going to see hopefully a lot of changes in the industry as a result of the passage of the PIB. Removing subsidy is very key. I think it's going to help everything. Um, it's not removed because yes, prices have increased. The market is not deregulated. What we can say is that there's been a price modulation. Uh, prices are more reflective of market uh, prices. So as long as we are not able to, as a private sector, import PMS into the country, then you know that the market is not deregulated because obviously there is some sort of subsidy at the exchange rate. It's baby steps in the right direction. We will get there. Uh, I think Nigerians are getting used to the idea of paying the right amount for electricity, for petrol, and for other services. And to say that government needs to deregulate and allow the private sector run these areas. And we should take our rightful place in, in the market. Uh, as Tony mentioned, we're a gas nation producing oil. Uh, we're an oil producing nation importing petroleum products. This should never have happened. And thankfully, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. Thank you so much. Um, you can see that I was a little generous with everybody across the board. I gave everybody a couple more minutes over and above your 10 minutes. Um, we're going to take a short break now and um, we're going to get, um, see uh, a video from one of our sponsors. However, in that period, I would really love for everybody to put their questions in the Q&A box, and then we'll come right back after the video and go straight into the panel discussion. Thank you. video from Nigeria LNG and uh, we want to thank them. They're one of the sponsors of this afternoon's event. We have 35 brief minutes to do our little panel discussion and um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for all the questions and um, comments from our participants. But before that, I want to say to all my panelists, thank you very much. You did a sterling job of expressing your industries, the sectors and the industries where you participate in, you give a lot of information. And when experts speak about issues, they make it sound so simple and understandable. And I really appreciate that because we have some non oil and gas people in the audience this afternoon. Thank you very much. And I know a lot of work went into that to be able to put in as much information into the short time that we've given to you. So thank you very much on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the people who are listening in this afternoon. So we'll go very quickly into our panel discussion. So if I can have everybody turn back on their videos and their speakers, and I'm just going to um, stimulate the conversation to start off with. One of the things that has been a theme um, 
through the discussions of all our panelists is the fact that government is driving a lot of what's still going on in the industry. And that is important in the fact that they are the supreme regulators. Mr. Oyebanji spoke about self-regulating. Um, we've seen that you know, government is slowly trying to pull back on the amount of inputs they have into the sector, both the midstream and the downstream, but you know, we're not there yet. So I would just like to ask each and, you know, each and every one of my panelists, what exactly would you really like to see the government do a little bit more of in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term? So, I mean, I'll start with Mr. Tony Atta, and then we'll go to Mr. Tunjo Yebanji, and then to Mahmoud. Thank you very much, uh, Roka. I think I can call you Roka. Yeah. Roka. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, thank you, I've been uh, very upfront with what I believe. Uh, uh, I mean, starting with the, the declaration uh, of the uh, year of gas, which is a very uh, worthy and uh, commendable uh, posture to take. Um, but as I mentioned in my presentation, I think you can't really achieve much in one year. You need to actually declare uh, the decade of gas and within that decade, really lay out the, the roadmap and the staircase to, to that point where you uh, maximize the value of gas and entrench gas as the next platform that uh, Nigeria will, that will catalyze the development of Nigeria. I mean, if you look at a country like Qatar, you know, when we started LNG uh, project, Qatar started about the same time with us. Um, yes, they have by far more reserves than we do but they have been very deliberate. Now that is the difference, the actual word being deliberate, deliberately focusing on gas as the catalyst to their development and industrialization and the belief that it is possible. But from where we stand, we have the, result, we have the reserves and we're just pretty slow. Now we started about the same time. Today, Qatar is at 77 million tons capacity. Nigeria is at 22 million tons. So, Last year at Christmas, uh, we pushed so hard to get the final investment decision uh, to grow capacity. And I said in public forum, oh, we're growing capacity by 35%. Actually, that's just 8 million tons. Qatar responded. Qatar responded. We add 8 million tons to 22, we go to 30. Qatar wants to increase from 77 by 30. So their incremental growth plan is my total existence as a company. And at that point, we started to say to ourselves that even trend seven is no longer ambitious. But if you listen to uh, what Mahmoud presented, look at the level of, uh, of, of gas development in the entire country. Less than 30% of what we produce is actually uh, consumed in the country itself. Most of it goes into two or three pipelines and that's it. And it's predominantly for power supply. If you remember in my presentation, I said, there is gas to power, there's gas to fertilizer. What uh, the Dangote uh, company is taking advantage is bringing fertilizer. Today we're importing fertilizer despite everything we have in terms of gas. It's gas to petrochemicals. Most of the feedstock into our petrochemicals today, propane, is being imported. Now, how can that be? That's what Mahmoud referenced that we are an oil producing nation that is importing petroleum products. So there's some very clear boundaries that needs to be broken and very, very clear uh, uh, paradigms that must shift for Nigeria to, to demonstrate that seriousness. But I think for me, the real thing is about being deliberate and being clear. If we need to adjust the legislation, so be it. If we need an act of parliament to make things happen faster, so be it. I mean, Nigeria LNG uh, was created during the military era. And if I tell you the story, there were a few, few fiats that were taken by the then military government to say, what will it take? Oh, we need to put $2 billion as a country into ExCo. Done. One statement, and it was done. So to go the way we are going is perhaps too slow at the moment. Look at the PIB that everybody's re re relying on. Investors are saying, I'm not going to move until I understand what PIB brings. I'm not going to invest until I know what kind of fiscal PIB will impose. By the way, PIB has been on the cards for more than 15 years. You cannot accelerate that way. But I believe firmly that the key active word is for Nigeria to be very deliberate about gas. And if you are looking for an example, just look across Qatar. 
Today, the GDP per capita in Qatar is more than 65,000 per, 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 per person. Nigeria is barely uh, 2,500. So for it to become a, 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 the, the giant of Africa that we want to be, it's got to be about resourcefulness, not about resources. And if you listen to one of uh, uh, Richard Quest's uh, statement, he says it's not about what you have, it's about what you do with it. So we've got gas in abundance, gas is cheap, gas is available, Nigeria has it in abundance, but the question is, what are you doing with it? And that's partly why when I concluded in my presentation, I said it's time for gas without a doubt. Without a doubt, Nigeria needs to be deliberate and let's go gas. Thank you. So deliberate and intentional with our gas. Mr. Tunji Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for me, I think uh, there needs to be a change of mindset. Uh, we really need to get to the point where people see gas, uh, see, see investors and investment as something that we need to pursue and not just pay lip service to. Really, I, I don't know whether the word is we actually have to have a situation where you know, investors are wood. They are made as comfortable and as uh, uh, welcome as possible. Not a situation where you put hurdles and, and challenges and it looks as if um, there's a, a lack of understanding uh, at the part of the people who decide these things of how important investment is to really developing, whether it's gas, whether it's refining, or whatever have you, uh, we need to bend over backwards to make the environment attractive to, to such things. But in terms of what does the government need to do now in the midterm and long term, I think for me, the common feature is that of collaborating and consulting with the players in the industry to one, set out what are the priorities as far as those industries are concerned, and then working with them to achieve and implement what those plans are. Uh, really, government should set the tone, work with the industry, set those plans, and then get out of the way because the private sector can move very aggressively and very fast. Uh, nobody really needs to prod the private sector. What re you really need to do is provide the enabling environment and the support that they need. Perhaps the best example you, you have of that kind of cooperation, sometimes when you see the bankers committee and the CBN governor sitting down regularly to agree on what steps to take in the industry, you know, that should be replicated in many other areas in, in, in the downstream instance where we jointly come together and say, for instance, we need to do like uh, Mr. Ta was saying, you know, what's the next level we should go to? And then government just creates the environment, does what it is supposed to do along the line, and then let private sector run with it. And then you will get the, the results you need. So for me, it's more about collaboration. It's more about consulting, uh, whether in the short, medium, or long term. Thank you very much, Mr. Oyabanji. And Mahmoud, on your part. Thank you, Ronke. I'll be very brief. I think if we keep talking about laws, so I have no, you know, there have been conversations about the cost of governance, uh, the cost of the National Assembly, the budgets, et cetera. I have no quarrel with that. But my only demand and request is can we please pass the important laws? Mr. Tan said we've had PIB in numerous versions for 15 years on the table. And this is a law that will significantly impact this country. Can we stop playing politics with it and pass it so they can actually help Nigeria? Uh, deregulation is very key. Um, and as we set up for the future and think about Nigeria, the deliberate focus, to go back to an LNG, I had the privilege of working on that project 25 years ago. So I watched LNG as a virgin site. I was there when it was developed and built. But guess what, Ronke? The entire infrastructure was set up to export, even the, uh, what do you call it, the byproducts. So the LPG that is produced, because of the parallel body length of the jetties, you can't put a small ship alongside to load LPG and bring it into Nigeria. They had to go 
load big ships and then do transshipments, etc. So as we develop train seven, as we develop other infrastructure, we must be deliberate also about meeting domestic supply. As in domestic supply must be or domestic consumption and access to it must be very key and clear in our focus. We must be deliberate about that to grow those words. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to ask a quick multiple choice question. The PIB, everybody's going to have to ask, answer and give me one possibility. Um, what is your priority? A quick passage of what right now? Fixing some, you know, going back to fix some more stuff or breaking it down as they had done, you know, prior into the PIGB, the host community one. So everybody tell me what you think we should be doing. Pass as it is, you know, make some modifications or break it down to pass. Ms. Tata. I, I think you don't have that much of a choice. I mean, it's already broken down. I don't see how you can reverse that. Uh, the ideal thing for me is to accelerate. Mr. And you have to accelerate. You have to accelerate. That's what we need. Mr. Ebanji. Yeah, I think we, we, we have what we have. If there are um, tweaks that we need to, to make, you need to listen to the industry operators. Uh, once you can listen to them and uh, you, you take their input into account, then use what you have uh, so we can move forward. No law is perfect. So over time, it will have to be amended in future. I think we've wasted enough time. So we should do whatever we need to do to tweak it now, make sure that it's fit for purpose with what already has been put forward. And then, uh, you know, as the years go by, if we now need to amend, we will amend in the future. Mr. Tuko. I wholeheartedly agree. The rule of uh, uh, Dubai said in the quest for excellence, there's no finishing line. Unfortunately for us, we have not even started the race. So let's pass what we have, good or bad. Nigeria has very smart people. This law is meant to help us or help the sector so engage the experts in the sector. Let's finalize it quickly. The National Assembly should put it as a priority. And let's get it done. They should say that, you know, if they don't pass PIB, they shouldn't pass their own personal budgets. Let's, let's, give, them, let's give them a KPI. So let's, let's put them on the, on, you know, on, let's put it on the front burner. Let's get it done so that eventually something will be done. If it's not great, come back in two years, amend it. But if there's input today, from the key operators, we will have a PIB that is maybe 80%, 90% acceptable to everybody. That is a great start. We'll continue to evolve and we'll get there. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Mr. Atta and ask him one question. The LNG, Nigeria LNG model is been, has been very, very successful. And something similar, you know, can be done across the industry because we tend to find out that, you know, maybe the government isn't um, able to fund their part of certain deals. You know, we've seen that in the upstream with the contributions. Um, how do you think um, Nigeria can leverage the Nigerian LNG model uh, across the sector to help, you know, the downstream sector and other areas where we need rapid, especially in terms of finding uh, I must say it's a, it's a very solid model, um, but I often smile when I hear people talk about the Nigeria LNG model as uh, that panacea, one solution that will take care of all Nigeria's issues. Um, what is important about the model, first and foremost, is that just like the upstream you mentioned, it's a joint venture, but the difference is that it is an incorporated joint venture. And I'll just say a little bit about that. In the upstream, you have unincorporated, which means multiple companies come together in agreement to do business. The business is the business, that is a JV. The companies stand alone as separate entities in that arrangement. In the incorporated joint venture like we have, the companies come together to form the joint venture and a company. So the joint venture and the company are one and the same in the case of the incorporated joint venture, which is what we have. So we are independent, more or less of our shareholders. For Trade 7, we haven't asked anybody for money. So unlike the, the upstream model where each 
JV partner has to contribute into the coffers of the business for things to happen. In the incorporated case, the company stands alone. We have gone to the international markets to borrow, which was the same way we built the first one, two, three, four, five, six trains. Now, we don't have that uh, challenge of waiting for shareholders to bring funds. And I think that's part of the Achilles heels of the, uh, of the upstream JV model today. Uh, it's easy to castigate that model, but don't forget for the past 50 years, that model has served us. But what it hasn't done is to respond to the dynamism in the marketplace. Government is struggling to find funds, but as it were today, for every investment in the upstream, government is expected to contribute 57% of that investment. And these are huge, huge numbers. They come in billions of dollars. If you look at our budget, what is our total budget for Nigeria? $40 billion per year. We looked at the uh, GDP of, uh, of, of, of Texas, GDP of, of, uh, of California, 1.6 trillion. GDP of Texas, 1.2 trillion. GDP of Nigeria, 390 billion. But yet you want to continue to be active and participate in the industry. But when the chips are down and you are asked to bring 57% of the cost of doing business, then the struggle comes in. But I think the other sharp difference between the NLNG model and the uh, upstream JV model is in the governance structure. So today I'm accountable to the board. Anything that the board cannot approve, unless I go to heaven, it stands unapproved. But in the case of the model upstream, there are just too many multiple uh, 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 processes required for a single decision to be taken. And because every company has a role to play in that decision, sometimes it takes too long. Sometimes the shareholder hat supersedes the business hat. And again, the interplay because there are competitors in multiple areas. The governance structure sometimes is in the way. Whereas in the energy model, because it's a standalone company, you have executive management, you saw in the videos, my management is 100% Nigerian. We report to a board. Once the board approves, off we go. So we are more nimble, we are more agile, we're faster to decision and faster to delivery. But I think the last big element is, is around the NLNG Act. So we have the NLNG Act which supports the company and helps us to be able to navigate some of the vagaries of society, which in the upstream, unfortunately, we don't have that, that much flexibility. The last bit is around transparency. Transparency is key. Every year we publish what we have earned, how much it costs us to earn, the dividend we pay to whom, and we produce what we refer to as the facts and figures. It's open. Every cent we have earned as Nigeria LNG from 1999 is documented and available for the general public. You need that level of transparency to drive the uh, agility and, uh, and progress of the company. I think for me, it is a model that has worked very well. It has potential to work in the upstream, but I must say it's not the panacea that will solve everything about the upstream uh, problems the way it's been positioned. Thank you so much. Mr. Ebanji, I have a question for you. Talk about the deficit, um, the trust deficit between you know, the government and the industry and the citizens of Nigeria. That's on one part. And on the other part, there's the fact that the margins in your business are so slim. And when margins are slim, risks are high. You're in a business where we're importing a lot of your inputs with foreign exchange and you're selling in Naira. And the money cycle from when you buy or import to where you have to convert your Naira earned back to foreign currency to redo the cycle, I mean, anything can happen. How do you marry this together? And how do you see this um, being tweaked so that you know, pe more people are encouraged to invest in this particular area in the downstream sector? Because I mean, I, I've just reeled out a few challenges that you have, and I'm sure you know, with your expertise and the amount of years you spent in this, you have some um, solutions to prefer. So what do you think should or can be done? And what, you know, who should do what? Is it government who needs to do more or you need to do more on your side? Could you just you know, shed some light on that, please? Okay, thank you very much. Um, up to this point, I want to say categorically that as far as the fuel side of the business is concerned, 
it has been an unmitigated disaster. All you need to do is look at the quoted companies or uh, the downstream uh, companies quoted on the Nigerian Stock Exchange over the last 10 years, and you find that all of them have lost value. Um, government prices at the pump meant that the margins available for the sale of petroleum products were also controlled by government. So irrespective of the costs that were prevailing in the industry, you know, your margins and the prices were fixed. So it, it was just a disaster. And um, for instance, uh, on the Dapman side, I can say categorically that over the last few years, over 30 of them have collapsed, uh, you know, with their assets taken over by Amcon. Uh, so it's been very extremely difficult. Now, the hope is that if we do have full deregulation and uh, we have a corporate, uh, you know, fair, a fair open market environment, then there will be competition. And once there's competition, people you will find will have to collaborate to bring about efficiencies. So maybe instead of three operators having three separate terminals, they may decide to collaborate together, work together to make sure that they can reduce their costs. So obviously efficiency becomes a key factor going forward in terms of uh, operations. And now in terms of uh, what else can be done, it is that the legislation and government really have to work to ensure that that playing field is even. So there can't be any sacred cows. Some individuals getting Forex at a preferential rate when other people don't get it at that same rate. Some people being on special import allocation schemes and other people not being on those schemes. All that has to give way. If we do not have a level playing field, then the regulation itself will be dead on arrival. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Tuko, I'm coming to you now. In terms of infrastructure, we're moving towards a gas era. And um, I still, you know, just looking around, you can see that we don't have the infrastructure to get gas to the power plants, to get gas to communities. Um, even in terms of waterways, you know, moving gas from the Nigerian LNG space, you know, Lagos is probably the best place to get the gas to, you know, we still have undeveloped markets like the Wari, Port Harcourt, Calabar, you know, the waters are uncharted, MPA. I mean, we have so many issues that we need to deal with. Where do we start from moving forward? And two, how are we going to come into the financing to finance this infrastructure development that we so dearly need? Because as much as we're all saying we should push the gas, unless we can move the gas to places where it's needed at, we're not really going to do very much going forward. So what's your take on that? You need to unmute. Thank you. I'm, I'm unmuted, sorry, thank you. Before I answer that question, I will answer it, but maybe take it back uh, and pick up a little bit from where Tony talked about uh, the energy model and the upstream model and incorporate it because not everybody here is an oil and gas person. But the reality is, okay, when you look at, let's say, SPDC, so you have the NMPC, you have Shell, you have uh, Total and, and Ajit, and they say they want $10 billion to, to develop oil fields. And Nigeria is meant to, the government is meant to give them 57 billion, I mean, 5.7 billion. And they say, sorry, we only have 2 billion for you this year. All, automatically, that JV has to go and redo its budget. And then how many critical projects would have been missed and what are the knock-on effects? Can you remember from the... Abacha era in Tobasanjo, we were talking about cash call arrears. Today, there's still cash call arrears. But the reality is, the question is, because of that simple governance, something that is producible, so you have reserves, that easily financeable, as you know, as a banker, under re re reverse, I'm sorry, reserve is lending, we're not able to access that. So the government has to take money and fund the JVs. If that, if that governance was sorted out, all the funding you're talking about in terms of critical infrastructure, the government does not need to actually fund oil and gas production. It can easily be taken care of by simple amendment of the laws so that the JVs are accountable, they have their, they have their boards, and they'll get on with their business. You don't need to go through NAPIM's approval, go to Abuja, come back, scale the budget, etc. So taking that into critical infrastructure, the laws must be passed to enable Private sector will always participate as long as you give them a free hand. We talked about telecoms. 
You can remember the days of NITEL. So compare NITEL of yesterday to Globalcom and MTN and whoever today. You would go into a place, pay 200,000 Naira, you get a line, it might work for two months, it rains, somebody's tapping your line, uh, you get bills that are not yours, etc. But then today you can walk into a shop you, online in, one, in a minute, you have a new line, you have per second billing, it's accurate because private sector and competition is driving it and the laws allow people to make that investment. So investment in gas and infrastructure is very critical and government doesn't have where maybe it's not immediately financially viable that requires some sort of government support. For the government to be able to allocate those resources, then those resources must be freed up from finite capital. We've talked about our GDP. You know, as we are 200 million people, we're getting to 400 million and we're not producing enough to meet those current demands and the future. So if we sort out some laws that allow, first of all, private capital to be able to, or the existing JVs and so on, to be able to produce oil, produce gas and give government revenues and dividends, that gives them money. So that money that they're not using to fund is available to actually fund critical infrastructure. So um, as, we, as we liberate the market, as we open up the sectors and we create enabling laws, private sector will drive this. I think that's my answer. Wow. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr. Ebanji, I want to ask you a quick question. Quick, quick question. Refining capacity in Nigeria. Our refineries are not working. A lot of Nigerians still believe that there's a possibility of the government rejigging or doing a turnaround maintenance to get them back working. Um, can we have your take on that? That's one. Two, what do you think the private sector needs to do in terms of refining capacity? Because we cannot continue to import petroleum products into Nigeria. I know that everybody is holding, waiting with bated breath for the Dangote refinery to come on, but irrespective of that, we have a national um, issue. With the fact that we have three non-working refineries and we are planning to now rely on just one. I know that there've been some small, um, I know there's a Walter Smith one and there are a few coming over. What is your take on what the government needs to be doing or, or rather the private sector needs to just leave with their refineries to fix whenever, however, and what should the private sector be doing in terms of refining capacity for Nigeria? Okay, let me try and uh, make this quite quick. Uh, first and foremost, my belief, I've always held this belief a long time ago. Uh, those refineries should have been sold a long time ago and uh, sold to, to private operators who probably would have been able to do much better with it. Um, I am aware that the current NMPC uh, is trying to do something different. Uh, I would not dismiss those efforts uh, because if they were doing the same old things, I would have said, you know, they, 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 they would be doomed to getting the same kind of uh, results. So in as much as they are trying new ways, and particularly it has to do with uh, financing. Um, people talk about turnaround maintenance, which is, uh, you know, just uh, like servicing your car. What those um, refineries need is complete rehabilitation um, because of their age and because of continuous lack of uh, maintenance on them at the appropriate times. So the funding and financing of that has been a big issue. And with NMPC having to make up for the cost of subsidizing or under recovery, um, having the, the funds that it needed to make those kind of fundamental, uh, uh, you know, upgrades and refurbishment of those refineries just wasn't possible. So I would say, let's see what can be done. Uh, I don't want to incur Tony's wrath by saying, why not try the LNG model? Because like he had pointed out, it may not be a panacea to every particular case, but certainly it would have been a good solution, I think, to the problem with the refineries if we had gone in that direction a long time ago. As for the private sector, well, um, definitely the Dangote refinery is uh, said to be the largest single train refinery in the world, 650,000 barrels a day. So it is huge. 
the, the nameplate for the three refineries that are owned by NMPC is 450,000 buyers a day. So definitely this is even bigger than the three of them combined. So it is going to go a long way, not only to virtually satisfying our local requirements, but also uh, giving room for export. Now, we also have the modular refineries, which private sector have been involved in. They will help. But ultimately, refining is about scale. It is a big business. When you have refineries like the Reliance uh, refineries in India that are 1.3 million barrels a day compared to even the Dangote refineries. So those are double the size of Dangote refineries. So these small modular refineries, uh, 10,000 barrels, 20,000 barrels, uh, I don't know how viable they will be long term. If you are located very well where they are situated, right or next to the fields that are producing the crude, so those may be able to survive uh, long term. At the end of the day, refining is about the economics of it. Globally, there's a huge overcapacity as far as refining uh, is concerned. And it is very capital intensive to invest in, in refining. So for me, uh, I think what needs to be done is for us to have bigger scale, larger refineries in the range of 150, 200,000 barrels per day. Those kind of refineries, I think, will help our situation more. Uh, the more investors that can either individually or gather together to invest in such, together with the Darren Godet refinery, will make uh, for Nigeria to become indeed the refining hub of ju not just West Africa, but indeed part of Southern Africa going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Mr. Tony Atta, next. I just want to find out on this issue of LPG and <laughs> LPG is still and I know that it's not your fault. I know that you know it's an initiative. Are you planning to deepen wood and coal aligned with the I'm, I'm struggling to hear. I don't know if it's just me. Um, I think there's some. Somebody needs to. Hello. Okay. I didn't quite hear the question, but it sounds like uh, you want to know what we're doing to deepen LPG into country. Yes. We're not. We're not. We, we're seeing the major city, the adoption of LPG. But then the bulk of my hands are in the interior. And you know, we're still struggling with penetration of LPG compared to coal and firewood and what exactly is that you are doing or you can do? And what kind of support do you need to have the MSMEs or the small or medium sized and kind of goals that you have moving from 50,000 to 450,000 or even double. No, th thanks for that. Uh, I hope I uh, got the question itself. Um, first of all, it's a very wide and long value chain, you know, and uh, you really have to choose uh, on the back of your area of strength where you plug in in the value chain. Um, to date, we are more in the market making uh, side of the chain, which is, as I said to you, before we got involved, and I think I saw uh, Mahmoud's uh, slide on it, it was really just 50,000 for Nigeria. But uh, today we are at a million where we've gone from 80% 80, 80 market share down to 35 because we've expanded the base and allow a few more players uh, to, to participate. I mean, at the onset, there were perhaps only four off-takers. It's my understanding that today there are more than 15 off-takers and it's about to grow. So for us, we are more in the market making uh, side of the value chain, making the products available and uh, continuing to do our best in terms of how much we can bring in. Uh, as it were, so this is the highest we have brought into country this year at over 350,000 tons. On the back of that performance and the deliberateness compared 
to our desire to reset the narrative on the 100,000 women and children largely who die on an annual basis. We sort of said, no, we can do more. And we've only just gone to our board the last two months to say, we have met the 350,000 uh, tons cap that you approved for us. We need a mandate to do more. And as I mentioned, we now have a mandate to do uh, 450,000, but it's not enough. Uh, and it's also not good enough to expect that only one supplier will meet the, 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 the national demand. We actually uh, sponsored a research work done by consultants in partnership with the Office of the Vice President to just look at the LPG value chain across Nigeria and that report is available. What it actually said was that the uh, average capacity of Nigeria in terms of LPG market is 3 million tons. So if anything, we have only just touched about 30% of what the true potential uh, of LPG could be in country. I think your question is more around, yeah, will we get into the, uh, the, 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 the more offtake side or the deepening the utilization, the burner tips? And at the moment, we're not directly uh, jumping into that space, but we think we are ready to continue to enable the market. And I tell you what, last year, uh, we, we partnered with a local supplier for the first time in the history of Nigeria. The LPG vessel that is supplying LPG from NLNG is owned by a Nigerian, a Niger Delta, because we enabled that space. It's, those are the kind of areas where we want to play more than actually creating uh, the 12 kg brake bulk and all that. It's, it's opportunistic, but we think we create the environment for others to be able to, to, to participate. Another major improvement we have done uh, prior to now a uh, very interesting uh, value chain that we describe and laugh at ourselves. So we produce LNG in Bonny, we ship it, we put it on ship, sell to Lagos, offload in a papa into a couple of tanks. Then from the tanks, a truck picks the same LPG, drives all the way back to Port Harcourt before it is bottled and put on the badge to come to me in Bonny to cook with. Think about that kind of value chain. That's just incredibly, wrong and terrible in terms of value destruction. But today in partnership and uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, a, a new terminal in Port Harcourt called Stop Gap, we are now able to take more volumes and molecules into Port Harcourt. Much more still comes to Lagos, but at least that broken value chain of taking the same molecule to a papa, putting it on a, on, on a vehicle, driving all the way back to Port Harcourt, get someone to bottle it in some depot, put it on a bike, bring it to me to cook with in Bunny was something we were not really proud of. But today I'm very proud that we've been able to reset that narrative by being able to supply directly into Port Harcourt, even though initially we had some draft uh, shallow depth issues, which again, you have to work with these uh, off-takers to just stimulate and open up uh, new bases. That's what we do. That's what we want to continue to do, consistent with our vision of helping to build a better Nigeria. And I think the LPG space is one opportunity which we cannot let go. But even bigger than that, I mentioned up front that we are looking at bringing domestic LNG into country as well. Starting with Lagos, of course, where you have by far bigger markets. And someone posted in the, in the chats, uh, how will you enable CNG? We will not go into CNG directly. In fact, LPG with uh, condensate is less than 5% of my total uh, uh, value creation uh, uh, model. So it's not one that I'm going to scale ahead of LNG. But if we bring LNG into country, it can be regasified and converted into CNG again as part of our contribution to Nigeria. Uh, more CNG based uh, opportunities can be enabled. Thank you very much. Mahmoud, one quick question for you. In terms of financing the industry, where should we be looking at? Because right now, the whole world is ravaged with the COVID issues. Financing is very, very scarce across the world. What are we going to do as Nigeria to attract financing for all the different things that we've mentioned today that are challenges and we need to spend money to develop this industry. So we're going to need money to make the money and to bring the ease that we want for the economy. So how do you think we should go about doing this? Thank you. Um, 
to answer that question, I would like to make a comment in agreeing with what Mr. Eban just said on uh, refineries. To say that refine, please, as people are looking at investing in refineries, refineries should not become like how we build depots in Nigeria. Um, suddenly there's a proliferation of depots, now half of them are empty. Refining economics, gross product worth are very key. Upstream operators, marginal fuel operators who are putting modular refineries can survive, but refineries must be scale of scale. So as people are looking to invest in this sector, be very careful about the size of refineries that we're building, because we may end up, as the super refineries come on stream, the other ones are going to become economically non-viable unless they are linked to a direct upstream source. So you're producing, crude oil has no value unless you refine it, we know that. So if you're producing as a marginal full operator and you have a topping plant to refine it next door and you're basically piping in, you can, you can get away with it maybe, but standalone petroleum refinery, five, 10,000 barrels a day, we should reach, rethink that model, otherwise we'll end up with a lot of depots. Coming back to your question on financing, you see, there's still money around the world looking for bankable projects. So in my opinion, first of all, let's break down, let's, let's break down the value chain. So Tony has mentioned, NLNG doesn't need any financing. They, they're self-financing. Upstream, if we figure out the structure, PIB, what the governance structure around the upstream, because already you have existing players, who are already committed, the reserves are in place, financing is a lot easier. The critical area for me financing should be focused on is gas infrastructure. I think money should be going towards gas infrastructure. That is what is going to quickly accelerate economic development in Nigeria. So gas infrastructure will help power, it will help industry, it will help everyday life. LPG we talked about, clean fuel, so it's cleaner, cheaper, more readily available. That is where money should be focused on. We have the NSIA, we have our pension fund, we have a lot of massive amounts of private equity chasing infrastructure development projects because they've done it around the world. America has how many kilometers of pipelines, all operated by the private sector. If you enable them and you give them security, you give them laws that allow them to be able to invest and recover their money, they will do so. In my opinion, gas is, is the key area that money should be focused on. Where should we find this money now? Ah, you have to ask the money people. <laughs> but Thank you so very much. I'm going to have to wind down this uh, discussion um, so that we can bring in all the questions. We have tons and tons of questions on the Q&A box and in the chat box. And um, I think we have about 20, 25 minutes to do that. I, I hope we're going to be able to cover as many of these questions as possible. I don't know if you gentlemen have had a chance to gl um, glance through the questions that have been sent to you directly. I'm just going to read out a few of them and then we'll just play it by air and see how many we can answer before you know, our time is up. And um, the Secretariat are actually keeping us on our toes to do with the uh, um, timing. Okay, so um, anybody can answer this question. I'm sure either Mr. Yetunji or Mahmoud or I, I, I'm not sure Mr. Atai is going to be interested in this. The DSDP is still ongoing. Why are we talking about deregulation and liberalization when the DSDP is still going on? And on the other hand, we also have the fact that some people can access foreign exchange through the central bank or through you know, special you know, issues or special proclamations from certain quarters can access funding and Forex at cheaper prices. How is this going to affect us going forward? And how do you shut that window and manage the gap between when NNPC actually stops importing and when the private sector takes over? Because there has to be a smooth overlap. We'll see the queues mount up again at the fuel pumps. Mahmoud, do you, do you want me to get into trouble or you will be the first to, to go? Let me, let me take a stab at it. Um, <laughs> If you really want a free, fair, and competitive market, DSDP should be scrapped. Um, you know, if you want a level playing field, then there shouldn't be any special arrangements uh, for any group or, or whatever. My understanding was that that scheme was put in place because of the exigencies of the, of the time. If we are indeed going to go to a fully deregulated market, then, you know, it should uh, eventually wind down. I think... It actually was supposed to have uh, 
been uh, ended uh, a few months ago, but it was extended because we, we got into all this rough patch and we needed something to transition uh, between where we were and this period. But the main driver of the issue today is, you know, um, not having enough foreign exchange uh, to, to be able to do the needful. So as that situation eases and improves, then I think uh, the, the DSP down. Uh, on Forex itself, definitely, again, we cannot afford to have any preferential treatment for anybody because you can imagine if I can land the product that uh, we and I get my foreign exchange at 3, 305 or 350 and somebody else has to go to uh, another window where he has to pay 450 or 460 for the same foreign exchange, then there's no way you can have a free and fair market uh, to operate. So I think the, the solution is that we need to eventually get out of DSDP. And I think that uh, going forward, we really must have equal access to foreign exchange at the, the same rate. But hopefully also um, as local refining uh, improves and more of the product is available locally, then I think that issue will itself die a natural death. I've just been informed by Secretary that we're well above our time. We've spent a lot more than we planned to. It's a very, very interesting conversation we have going. And I mean, we could go on for another couple of hours. So I'm going to end, um, ask for the permission of our audience if we can catalog these questions and have the um, Chamber of Commerce put this question and answer session online. So we will have to reach out to the different um, panelists we've had to please just give us like brief um, answers to some of these questions. Because I mean, there are a lot of questions and even I want to ask my own questions that I haven't been able to ask enough of them. And um, at this point, I'm gonna to have to hand back over to the Secretariat because we have to wind down the session. I want to really thank the audience for staying with us. I want to thank my distinguished panelists for a job. You guys have done fantastic work and have, you've taken time out of your very busy schedule to be with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And most especially, we want to thank our, um, the sponsors of this, um, the three sponsors that we have for putting their money where their mouths are in terms of the industry and the sector and how we're going to move forward. And also, you know, a big thank you to the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. Very timely, very topical. And it's, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there'll be a part two of this because the conversation definitely needs to continue. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ronke. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. Actually, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you for having us. Well, um, awesome session, I must say. I'm sure you all agree with me that um, I have, like you, uh, found the session very enlightening and the conversations very stimulating. Uh, I'll ask that you please give a virtual round of applause uh, to our wonderful panel and an excellent uh, moderator for doing justice uh, to the subject matter. They have clearly provided some uh, direction as to the way forward in the oil and gas mid and downstream uh, sectors. And so on behalf of Mr. the President and Chairman of Council, Mr. Kayo De Falawo, I thank Mr. Tony Atta, CEO uh, NLNG, Mr. Tunji Oyebanji, CEO 11 PLC, Mr. Mahmoud Tukor, CEO Ash Group, Ash Group, Group and Ms. Ronke Onodeko, Principal Consultants, DRNL Consult Limited. Thank you so very much for taking time out of your very busy schedules uh, to share with us your thoughts um, this afternoon. I thank our sponsors, NLNG and 11 PLC for the generosity we deeply appreciate. I thank the chairman, Mr. Taj Shubaya and members of the oil and gas uh, group of the NNBC, of the NBCC for putting together this webinar and of course our ever supportive uh, secretariat. I thank our patrons, council members, ESCO members, and all attendees at this webinar. You have all been wonderful. Before we close, please permit me to share with you details of our forthcoming um, programs, even as I ask you um, to, to join us. Um, next week, we'll be having uh, the Nigerian EduTech Conference, which is the second in the series, the second edition of the EduTech Conference is on the 18th of November. 
registration is open, sponsorship opportunities, of course, are available. You can see the lineup of speakers uh, that we have. Um, again, next week on Thursday the 19th, we'll be looking at the Nigerian economy, uh, doing a review um, of 2020 and forecast of 2021. Um, and we have distinguished uh, speakers, Mr. Biona Adetipe and Mr. Ola Onodilipupu. Um, again, the week after that, we'll be having um, another webinar, uh, this time around looking at um, the agri sector, the NBCC Agri-Food Conference and Exhibition. It's coming up on the 26th of November, 2020. Um, sponsorship op opportunities, again, are available. And we'll be ending the year on um, the fantastic note with a big bang. Uh, we'll have our annual uh, dinner and awards, the presidential dinner and awards is coming up um, in December, on the 4th of December um, at 6 p.m. Uh, please look out uh, for details. For those of us on this call that haven't yet joined the NBCC, I invite you to join us. Um, details of joining are available on our website and you can start your journey to joining the foremost bilateral chamber of commerce in Nigeria. Uh, please follow us on our social media platforms, uh, as you can see um, on the screen, and we'll be happy to um, have you uh, join us. You can follow us, uh, as follow us activities on the uh, various social media platforms. So once again, thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon, as we look forward to seeing you at our events next week and later on in the year. Um, good afternoon and uh, God bless. Thank you. <laughs>